non-partner sexual violence, we can see that it's not an exception. We can, uh, in fact, identify risk factors. Uh, we can identify several expressions of victimization and vulnerabilities of men and women. Uh, we also um, saw and heard and understand that this is a problem uh, that happens in conflict settings, but most of all in non-conflict settings. So it's a, a, an epidemic problem also uh, in non-war contexts. This links directly to the need of changing hegemonic masculinities. Uh, the three speakers, uh, they all uh, brought the issue of violent, dominant, and hegemonic masculinities. And this links directly to Alvaro's intervention on gender transformative secondary uh, prevention methodologies. The need to transform hegemonic masculinities and the example of the reflexive groups um, that he directs at WEM, combining different mechanisms, different methodologies like therapy and community campaigns. This is also uh, an important example to understand the drivers for change. Why do men go to uh, these ther uh, therapy groups? Why do they want or why do they choose to change? Um, also, uh, we talked about the importance of measuring the change uh, and how to measure the path from male domination to uh, caregiving. And finally, Vrinda, uh, brought us the possible answers uh, to promote prevention and also simultaneously to give answers and appropriate answers to the problem. Um, focused uh, more on the Indian context, Rinda talk, uh, told us about the recent paradigm shift in the in Indian legal system and that now the weight is not only on the victim, uh, it's not on the vit victim anymore, uh, and this is, in fact, a path in the recognition of the root causes of gender discrimination. The Vrinda's central idea, uh, at least in my opinion, from me, from what I uh, heard, is the responsibility of the state on the issue. The responsibility of the state in promoting, in promoting a system that needs to be accessible and responsive, and re the responsibility of the state in order to fight impunity, and responsibility not only of the Indian state, but all governments globally, to, um, to promote policies that contribute to preventing vulnerabilities. So with this uh, sum, I would like to start and open the stage for questions and answers. We, I think we have uh, 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. So. It's okay? Yeah. Hello, my name's Thea Sharrock from the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. Um, my question is, for the whole panel, really. Um, and it's about, in terms of engaging men and boys to address sexual and gender-based violence, I'm interested to hear more about the interconnections between prevention and response interventions, where responses to violence can integrate services, including access to justice, healthcare for survivors, counseling, and psychosocial therapy that help mitigate against further violence and promote cycles of rehabilitation within state and society for people and communities, which is more about those interconnections. Thank you. Uh, to the panel for very interesting uh, presentations. I just wanted to uh, bring up the question of the class profile of the perpetrators. This was an issue that was brought up in yesterday morning's panel. And we find, uh, like in the U.S., the people who fill the prisons in the U.S. are people of a particular racial profile. And I think it's the same in all our countries. There's a certain demographic that tends to fill the prisons. They are the ones who are always suspected, arrested fairly quickly, and the criminal justice systems work quite promptly to convict them and put them in behind bars. We've been hearing about that, I think, yesterday and this morning. 
So I think the class profile is a significant question that we all want to address because there is this, char there is this kind of trend to keep researching crime and sexual assault among either poorer countries or poorer communities. Among all of us who are you know, development researchers, we keep tending to focus on those who are deprived, considering them to have this sort of latent ability to inflict violent assault. And I think we are kind of detracting uh, from other perpetrators of assault and violence who wield power on other grounds, like economic grounds or racial grounds, and we kind of tend to not research them enough. And therefore, we tend to ignore them in our policy making and our thinking. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is to Alvaro, uh, which is um, what experience from the United States on uh, batterer programs has shown is that a lot of people go in for counseling because they have been sent there by the judicial sy system. And because that in itself is a coercive act um, to, es to um, set off some kind of punishment, they tend to go back to battering ways really fast. And I'm wondering what your experience with that has been. I don't want to call it recidivism because violence is not an addiction or anything. It's, it's uh, you know, once the lens is off and once the lens of the criminal uh, justice system is off, to what extent are these kinds of programs effective? Because what you showed was that there's uh, only one category of men who comes to you voluntarily. Most of them seem to be referred from the criminal justice system. So that's one question. The second one is for Rachel. And I'm wondering, you showed us a graph about reasons for why uh, men, you know, men perpetrate vi sexual violence, which was entitlement, entertainment, post drinking, etc. And I'm wondering from a methodological perspective, isn't it usually a combination of all of those things? Because being drunk is not in itself a reason for somebody to perpetrate rape, but usually it's coupled with a sense of entitlement and more importantly, a knowledge of impunity. Uh, and impunity actually runs across whether the person is rich or poor or middle class or anything else. And to my mind, uh, how does one bring in impunity in that whole conceptual framework of studying why perpetration of violence happens? Uh, we'll take this. Well, we already have five questions. Maybe we can make this round and then the last round. Goes. Right. Thank you very much for the questions. I will answer them just in the list I wrote them down in, um, in the order. Um, just starting with the last one. Methodologically, yes, the motivations are a combination. And in fact, we um, that graph, which unfortunately we can't still see, was actually constructed in a way so that each group of motivations could add up to 100%. And so, in fact, people were able to endorse motivations linked to sexual entitlement as well as linked to alcohol, for example. Um, and so, but we saw even in that context, not everybody endorses every motivation, but sexual entitlement was... Sexual entitlement was the most common, and um, the group of entertainment seeking was very, very similar, and obviously those are quite closely linked. We didn't ask questions about impunity, and over the years, the work I've done with rapists, which 
tests that people wouldn't be able to answer them very clearly. And in fact, we uh, developed these questions after interviewing men about um, sexual violence and impunity didn't come up as a motivation. I think at a population level that men, obviously in terms of going out to rape, may be influenced by a perception about whether they will end up in jail as a result of what they've done. But I think at an individual level, men don't sit around and think, gosh, I'm bored, I'm going to go and rape somebody, um, and I know I can because I won't uh, you know, go to jail, or I want to rape somebody, but I'm not going to do it because I'll go to jail. I think the people don't actually think about impunity um, in, in that way. But obviously, I think as a global project, trying to end impunity is incredibly important. The one thing we do need to realize is that there isn't any country in the world that's ever succeeded in doing it. And rape conviction rates are universally appalling in every country in the world. And um, I think it's a real challenge for legal systems to actually change the way in which rape is prosecuted, because otherwise conviction rates will never be um, raised to the level where impunity will work well. I think that social sanctions within a community and within a family are actually going to be much more powerful in terms of influencing whether men will rape or not. Um, if I can just talk about what works to prevent violence. On the um, batterers program, it is true that the American data for batterers programs is extremely mixed, and many of the studies sh show that they're not very effective because the dropout rates are really high. It's also true that they're usually evaluated in terms of whether the men end up back in the criminal justice system. And given that so few men do end up back in the criminal justice system, that may not be a very good way of evaluating the program. So there are quite big methodological issues in the way they've been evaluated. We did a review as part of what works earlier this year um, to try and answer the question as to whether there are any response mechanisms that actually um, have evidence that they do feed into the prevention of sexual violence. And in fact, we didn't find any that had um, been evaluated in studies across a range of sec settings that did do that. And I think it might be the wrong question to ask, because primarily we um, put response mechanisms in place in order to assist people who are victims of violence um, and in order to assist or to try and assist with individual men to try and stop them individually uh, re-perpetrating after they've been identified as being... Um, perpetrators of violence, but in fact the biggest task in terms of prevention is not to work with those groups, but to work with the men who have not been identified as perpetrators of violence, and hopefully also to work with men who haven't ever perpetrated violence, try and stop them ever doing it. And that requires a different type of intervention. Alvar will answer in Spanish, so if you need translation, <laughs> or I don't know. Yes? El trabajo con hombres debe ser multifactorial. Por un lado, es necesaria que existan políticas públicas para trabajar con hombres. Y además, pero las políticas públicas por sí mismas no generan cambios en los hombres, generan oportunidades para trabajar con hombres. Hay que trabajar con hombres a nivel comunitario, a nivel grupal. Eh, nuestra experiencia es que si el hombre va obligado, una buena cantidad de estos hombres no aprenden nada en el programa. La mitad se comprometen cuando ven a otros hombres cambiar, porque nosotros eh, tenemos, los hombres que van referidos por sistema judicial están también junto a los otros hombres que van por su propio deseo, reciben el mismo programa ambos. Entonces eso hace de que los que van obligados vean a los demás y se empiecen a interesar. Entonces muchos de los que van obligados les gusta el paso es que 
el proceso de decodificación inicial, que es el significado de ser hombre, cómo aprendí a ser hombre y esto que me está pasando tiene que ver con eso que aprendí, si logran involucrarse con esa primera tarea, se quedan en el proceso. Hay algunos que cumplen las 45 sesiones, se van y nosotros estamos conscientes de que hicieron muy pocos cambios, fueron nada más por un requisito legal. Es necesario, por lo tanto, crear toda una cultura que no tolere la violencia. Allá le hemos llamado crear ambientes libres de violencia, libres de homofobia, libres de hostigamiento sexual, libres de violencia sexual, libres de todo tipo de discriminación. De tal manera de que el contexto social también posibilite a los hombres que ya no pueden hacer lo que, lo que nos dé la gana, decimos. ¿verdad? Por otra parte revisar la construcción de la masculinidad, el eje sexualidad es fundamental. En nuestra construcción de la masculinidad, todos aprendemos una sexualidad que tiende a ser abusiva de los derechos de las otras personas. Es necesario entonces, para resumir, acción estatal, política pública, gobiernos locales comprometidos, instituciones públicas comprometidas, pero también trabajo de base, trabajo comunitario, trabajo con hombres líderes de las comunidades, el trabajo con hombres que todavía no han cometido actos de violencia y también el trabajo con hombres que ya han perpetrado actos de violencia. ¿Tienes uh, una traducción? Sí, sí. Alvaro said that when, in the cases when it is mandatory, you don't see as much change as if they go voluntarily. But when they, uh, when they are in the group and when they go to the group and when they see uh, the others changing, they tend to adhere to, to the therapeutic group and to the methodologies. Uh, that you need to combine these several approaches and methodologies uh, because the groups are different. And he also reinforced the, Rachel's idea in the beginning that you need also to work with groups in order, um, nonviolent groups in order to prevent this kind of violence. Did I miss anything, Mary? Okay. <laughs> so, Brenda. I'll begin with the last question. Uh, yes, it is true that this delay is a very important, uh, uh, is, is a critical problem, not just because, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, that she should receive speedy justice, which is part of her fundamental right, but because that period is a very difficult period where we know that there will be a lot of pressure brought to bear upon her to withdraw. In fact, even today, if you see the data of 2012 and 2013, the number of women complaining at the police station and the number of women deposing in court, there is a huge mismatch. Very few women are actually reaching the courtroom to give evidence, because clearly there is high levels of attrition taking place, which actually brings us to the point that simply changing the law does not make the legal system either accessible or sensitive. Who is going to help her navigate? We do not have a victim witness protection that is worthwhile. Uh, secondly, you also need to see, and this is an exercise that I think more of us should be doing regularly, at the time of the budget, please see what is the allocation made to the judicial system. A very large number of people in India depend on the legal system for human security, not for the allocations made to the defense for uh, uh, you know, protection of the borders. Security of the people of this country is also contingent on Will the law become a deterrent to violence? One of the lowest allocations each year in the budget is to the judicial system, and we need to work on that and, and link that to the issue of human security. Um, coming to the other uh, aspect that was raised by, raised by Jashodra here on the issue of class, I think in India it actually comes together very significantly when uh, class as well as cultural and social stigmatization of the Dalit community. And in fact, if there is one kind of rape and sexual violence that is routine in this country, it is of Dalit women. Dalit being uh, uh, the community that is under the Hindu religious code uh, seen as the outcast. 
and therefore suffers from huge economic, social, cultural, religious stigmatization and subordination. The one area where post-2012 and the Varma Committee and the protests we've not been able to make any breakthrough is to either create prevention or create a breakthrough in uh, uh, Dalit girls and Dalit women accessing justice, not because they have not protested, not because Dalit women are not seeking justice, but because the, uh, the system, the bias and the prejudice within the system is so resistant that there is no breakthrough being made and there is no political will to create that breakthrough for uh, Dalit women. And clearly we need to focus on those aspects and how the economic subordination creates conditions for that. Just one last thing that I may add, uh, as Rachel mentioned very clearly, the criminal justice system is not going to be able to provide us answers of prevention. Perhaps where we need to look, and this uh, uh, is particularly true for South Asia and India, that will, if, if we were to shift our lens towards greater sexual autonomy, towards greater sexual agency, towards more freedom, will that actually create conditions of uh, more, uh, uh, of relations which are where violence is diminished? And here, therefore, things like decriminalizing consensual homosexuality, as in, which continues to be criminalized in India, uh, is something that we need to also look at carefully. And um, uh, to see where there are non-consensual relations, there is a lot of violence against, say, people from the transgender community, as well as men, particularly in situations of custody. How, does, how, how is protection provided by the law, even to them, uh, the, the decriminalization being the first step, and then uh, alongside, not the first step necessarily, but alongside ensuring that protection is extended to others who are experiencing violence. Um, I know we have uh, lots of questions, uh, but we only have time for two more. So, for the sake of time, over there, in the back. Okay. And I encourage <laughs> the others to use lunchtime to, to talk with our speakers. I'm sorry. But <clears throat> increases the violence and the power of the state um, with seeing the state as the kind of responsible actor to solve the issues of justice um, when it comes to sexual violence. One last question. I, I think here... Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Over there. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Juan Guillermo. <laughs> I stole the microphone from you. Hi, everyone. Brian Heilman from the International Center for Research on Women. I'll try to be quick. This is this session on crime and justice. So we've talked a lot about formal legal and criminal justice systems. But there, are, I just kind of wanted to bring our attention also to the many, many kinds of more community-based, informal justice practices that women survivors of violence interact with at kind of a much, much bigger scale. So these have names like alternative dispute resolution, mediation, reconciliation, restorative justice. And I think they're important for us to consider because it's the sorts of services that probably the majority of survivors of violence interact with. And there are pros and cons about them. They're very community-based, which has the positive of 
promoting a lot of ownership by a community and maybe legitimacy, but maybe a negative side is that because they're so community-based, they're in, imbued with those same inequitable norms <laughs> that drove violence in the first place. So the question for anyone on the panel who's w who wants to take it on is what do those types of practices have to do to better guarantee the rights and autonomy of women survivors of violence, and can you point us to any uh, good examples? Thanks. Thank you. I invite the speakers to, to answer to the questions and make some final remarks, just one or two sentences or messages. Thank you. I can comment on traditional um, and informal justice mechanisms. There is one example of Kathleen Daly's project from Australia, which had some positive results for w working with sexual violence perpetrators and survivors. But in fact, there aren't really other good examples. And the problem with most traditional systems is they're extraordinarily patriarchal. And in fact, in a lot of the systems, women aren't even allowed to go and give evidence and represent, uh, you know, and, and testify or be represented by themselves or by other women. And so it's extremely difficult for women to get proper justice from those systems. Um, and the other problem is that in countries that are have a sort of mainstream system as well as an alternative system. Um, rape is normally criminalized, and it's very difficult to say we'll go to the alternative system instead of going through the criminal system. And it's not in, alternative systems would require men to um, plead guilty, particularly in any restorative system. And it's not in anyone's interest to do that if they still are going to face a criminal case. So actually these forms of justice don't work very well for um, w women at all and for sexual violence. And you know their, their role and their potential in areas where the state is very weak and where um, there actually isn't a very good formal justice system hasn't really been defined in a way that makes them very helpful either. I still think that our primary task is to prevent sexual violence from ever occurring in the first place. And that's about changing hegemonic masculinity and about changing ideas around um, gender relations within communities. Um, to your question, which is a political philosophical question, I would actually not use the word responsible. I am keen on making the state accountable. I uh, agree with you that the state is the perpetrator of violence, either directly or through acts of omission. When, the, when there is this kind of violence against women taking place, clearly the state is not exercising due diligence. And therefore, the state is abdicating its, its uh, duty to uh, make sure of the well-being of its citizens. The idea here is how do you create accountability of the state? And in a democracy, I think that's what you do. You constantly... Uh, uh, create, uh, ask questions and challenge what the state is saying is, is uh, fine for us. The other thing that we need to look at, and this I referred to at the end, that what is our understanding of the state and how does it link to our understanding of masculinity? Do we need to therefore somewhere question and interrogate the notion of a militaristic nation state? I think that is really which what lies at the heart of this issue. And if the, if the person at the helm of the nation state is going to uh, uh, be measured by uh, how many inches a person's chest is, clearly we are not talking about leadership of women in this country. If we are talking at the, on the one hand of women's safety and on the other we are letting loose people on the ground to control women who are seeking to have relations of marriage, have relations outside marriage with uh, or relations with p persons of other sexual orientation, these are not things that can be, these are incongruous things. So for instance, the recent uh, challenge by young people of saying that we will express love. I think this is the way this kind, and, uh, the, what, you know, the kind of uh, state masculinity, which is bred through a certain kind of culture and a certain kind of, uh, of uh, uh, fundamentalist religion, will, will have to be challenged. Um, 
On, on the question of uh, alternate dispute, one is, of course, the traditional systems. And I actually agree with Rachel, uh, at least the evidence and the documentation till now is not very encouraging at all. Uh, there are, however, efforts by women in different parts of India, at least I can talk about, where women have been able to make breakthroughs of what will be the nature of that dispute settlement. And there you can see that the principles on which decision making will be done, who will decide. If those are changed, then one can look at it. However, I would like us to be a little careful here. Uh, in India, there's a huge alternate dispute resolution system. Uh, including mediation, etc., that goes through the formal legal system. The formal legal system is actually encouraging people to go into this form of legal system. Is that happening only because they think these are better ways for people in these kinds of, of disputes, whether it is marital relations or other forms of disputes, uh, to get justice? Or is it because administratively the legal system is very, very overloaded, at least in India, and therefore, the people who can actually be pushed out of it most easily are women and others, while the corporate sector and the state fights its rights out. So who is the legal system actually delivering justice to now? Thank you very much, Alvaro. I don't know if you want to make some final remarks. Hay una diferencia muy grande entre el hombre que ha perpetrado violencia sexual y el hombre que ha perpetrado otro tipo de violencia. Eh, en el caso del hombre que ha cometido violencia sexual, nuestra experiencia es que casi nunca lo reconoce. Antes de que tenga el juicio, no lo reconoce porque teme las consecuencias que va a tener esto. Y cuando ya ha sido juzgado, tampoco lo reconoce porque por vergüenza, temor o las razones que sean, reconocer que yo cometí un delito de abuso sexual o lo que fuera, de alguna forma me coloca en una posición vulnerable y la masculinidad nos lleva a que, a que no puedo colocarme en posición vulnerable. Esto hace de que para trabajar con estos hombres es necesario trabajar la masculinidad hegemónica para que de alguna manera puedan reconocer esa otra parte. Y cuando reconocen algo, reconocen apenas un porcentaje 